Thank you. Okay, Nixukoax. Okay, Nixukoax. Nistu Anako Knito Kimi. Ne tutu am scrappy pikani. What I just said is hello, all my friends. Uh, to uh, Neil and to the Conservancy and to all the people of Glacier and also to our ancestors for allowing us to be here tonight. What I just said was, hello all my friends, my name is Neet Dokimi, that means lone camper in our language. That was given to me when I was born back in the 50s by my great grandfather who um, was also part of the making of Glacier. Um, and his grandf our grandfathers before us. But he was also instrumental, him and my grandmother, when they established the big hotel, uh, Glacier Park, and they were part of the Winald Reese series and a lot of the uh, greeting of the, the tourists and development of the Great Northern with, with different people. And that's who gave me that name. I also said that I am from the South Pagan, and the South Pagan is what you know as Blackfeet but we are one of four bands in the whole confederacy. And that confederacy is a big confederacy. We are the only ones in the United States of America. The other three are in, in the north country, north and east of us, and north and west. And the other part of us, the North Pagan, are in Brockett, Alberta. The other is uh, the Gaina, and they are in Cardston and Standoff, Alberta area. And the other is Blackfoot, or Siksika, and they are up towards Calgary and east of Calgary. So that confederacy is pretty big. Also, the land base was, it was huge before we were placed on reserves, as we call them in, the, in Canada, and reservations here. Uh, the land base ran from down to the Yellowstone, all the way over into North and South Dakota, up into Saskatchewan, the North Saskatchewan River in Alberta, and around again meeting the backbone of the world, the Rocky Mountains, and over to this side and down. So that was a vast area. One of the things that make us very unique is that area alone. We are probably one of the very few, if not maybe uniquely the only ones, that are in our original territory that Creator gave us. So that is kind of a unique aspect as to how we identify ourselves. So that's why I introduced myself as North Pagan or South Pagan, because it's really great in our history and the way we teach one another is to know who you are, know where you came from, gives you a good idea as to where you're going, to know where you're going in this world. And that's part of the basis of who we are and where we come from and how we live. The other part of that is, is um, this territory alone is um, so precious. And you heard Neil say that this is the crown of the continent. I mentioned the, the Rocky Mountains here. This is what we call uh, the backbone of the world. And the reason we do that is you can see why. Not only is it beautiful, but the backbone of the world is, is part of, it gives you that stability and it lets you know where you are and where you come from. And we depict that on different things, such as the, the lodge you see over here and some of the, the traditional clothing that we don't wear every day. We wear these now, same thing you do. Um, Cotton and polyester and all that stuff is, is easier to acquire and much more comfortable. But um, it's part of the world today. That confederacy also um, established much more than just um, what we hear and see and know. The languages are the same. The language is the same. We don't have a religion. We have what we, we call it our way of life. It's called the Nitzita Pisani. And that way of life dictates to us how we are, how we live, and what we do each day. So we pay honor each day to ourselves. As we wake in the morning, the first thing we see is the sun. The last thing we see as it goes down is the closing of the day. So we, in ancient times, we functioned from dusk till dawn. And then there, were, um, there was no Gregorian calendar or the watches or the clocks to, to go by. So we went by the sunrise and sunset, the moonrise and moonset. We went by the seasons and our seasons were winter and summer. So we had two seasons to balance us out. And inside that confederacy, we also have three or four other things that make us very unique. And one of those is the Okan or the Medicine Lodge. I mentioned that we don't have a religion, but that is the most powerful 
and it's the most highly reverent ceremonial that we do even to this day. It's thousands and thousands of years old. And that is comparable, if you have any hierarchy in any churches, that is comparable to the Pope status in the Catholic Church or the leaders of any other, other um, uh, religion. That is, that is the, the ultimate. Next we have the way that we, we pitch our lodges, the way that we decorate them. That is very unique, for, our, for we pitch our lodges with the door facing east. A lot of other bands or tribes will pitch with their, the door some other direction. You can always tell ours where they're, where they're placed. And they're always in a C formation in a camp, the same with the medicine lodge. The other new, unique aspect is the war bonnets. You've heard of war bonnets, all of you, I'm sure, that the ones that sit back and the one that John Ma Wayne made famous in the movies where he would kill or make, shot, make one shot and all, uh, 10 Indians would go down, but they all had the same war bonnet on. And that war bonnet is the Sioux style. We do also wear that Sioux style, but ours is straight up. It's a straight up bonnet with the feathers going straight to the sky to pay tribute to that eagle as well as the creator up there in the sky. The other important uh, aspect that's unique for us is the smoking pipe that we use. You've all heard of peace pipes. You've all heard of uh, smoking pipes. Ours is black, the stone is black, the other pipes that are in the, in the world today are, are red. But we're very, very, um, I guess, unique because of that black stone pipe. And there was a quarry that we get it at. We still do that today. And it's also um, a way that we polish it with, with the, we, what we call greasewood, you know as potentilla. And the other aspect is, is how we are with our languages, uh, our plants, and the, the common reverency that we have for the cosmos. We're very close to the moon, the sun, the stars, the earth itself, and where those planets are. We also are the only band and tribe that I know of that knows that, that, the, that the sky has a belly button. If you all say, ooh, yes, ooh, yes, and then just think of your belly button, that's a hole in the sky that you know as the North Star. And that's very important in our culture and our traditions, as well as our, our, um, the, the way that we, were, we came about to be here. But everybody in the world, the universe, knows that North Star because it is a guiding light for many, many people and many, many things. But that is the hole in the earth that was made by the sacred woman that put up the first medicine lodge. Okay? In talking about the universe and talking about our, our art, artistry, our craftsmanship, and our, the way that we, we do our, our lodges, we have a, a little small example here that's, um, should we pass this around? Pass it around in a second. But this also tells you a story. And if you know how to read this, you know the symbols are not just circles, triangles, and squares, and maybe sometimes rectangles and straight lines. Each one of those have a, have a significance. As I mentioned earlier, we always, pitch the lodges with the door facing east. This side is the female side. This side is the male side. Anything on the bottom is the ground, represents the ground. Anything from here up represents the sky. And then inside here, if it is painted with certain designs, animals or plants, that represents the dream that the person had that has the right to put that on there. Now, not just anybody can put anything in the middle. That has to be a special ceremony. It has to be a special transferred right to receive a design here. Everybody can paint from the top up and the bottom down, and that tells you who you are and where you live. These little triangles on the bottom represent what? The mountains. If there was an elongated half, half uh, triangle with a circle on the top, that re would represent what? Foothills, there you go. And if there was a straight line all the way around, plains, there you go. So you'd be able to read where this person was from, okay? These little round circles on the bottom also represent part of the ground, but they also represent the sky as well. These are called dusty stars or puffballs, and those puffballs are simply a mushroom that we find here on Earth. And before we found that mushroom on Earth, it was a person. And it was that little boy that came down from that hole in the sky with his mother. But these are the puffballs. 
that are represented on the bottom here. And you can see them when you go on your trail hikes, I think, maybe. There's the puff, the smoke that comes out of there. That's a plant. It's not a morel mushroom, so don't eat it. The powder inside was also used for a paint, but it was also a blood stop. It was used as a medicinal as well. So up on the top we have this side here. And remember I said this was the sky? Those dots are just not dots. They stand for a cluster of stars that's a prominent constellation. Anybody like to take a yes? There you go, Pleiades. For us, this is the lost children. And there's a very reverent story, an extensive story that goes about how this got here. And that has to do with the door of the lodge and also buffalo robes. Buffalo is one of the other, the other objects and the other animals that is so important to us. But little children wanted yellow buffalo calf robes. In the spring, when those buffalo calves are born, their calf their robe, their hide is either a yellow or, and then it turns red and then it turns a darker brownish color. They wanted those because it was an honor to have that as children, to have the, the buffalo calf robe. They didn't get it right away. So a group of them decided they were not going to go with the rest of the camp. And they stayed behind as the rest of the camp wandered, went, went to where they were going. And those children became hungry, they became lost, and they became sorry that they did that. So when you're a child and you're lost, what would you do? Uh, call your friends. Yeah, but you didn't have a cell phone <laughs> or any way to get a hold of them. So those children did call their parents, but their parents were way far away. So what do you think they did? They got hungry. They began to get lonesome, and then they got a little afraid. And so they just sat down and cried. And the Creator above heard them and took them all into the sky with him, much like you would do uh, or listen to a Percy Jackson tale or a tale of the Greek gods and goddesses or something of that nature where it was very mystical at the time, where we could talk to the stars, we could talk to the earth, we could talk to the rocks and the plants and the animals and everything. So Creator decided that those children would go to the sky with him and that become Pleiades for us in our way. This also becomes the lost children's story and it's there represented on our lodges. So that's what that cluster of stars is. On the other side, there are seven stars. Would anybody like to take a guess as to what those might be? What are seven stars in the sky that are pretty cool and they're, well, we hope that we have a clear night tonight where we can, there you go. That big dipper in our language is called Ikasikamiks. That means seven cold feet. And those children or the, were seven brothers and one sister that also mystically went to the sky. Not before they created where you're sitting, what you're looking at, what you breathe, what you drink, and sometimes what you eat. Because one of them had the gift of making the rocks, dirt, plants, trees, the forest, the gorges in the earth, and the big water, the lakes and the riverbeds and also the oceans. And each one of them were given the right to have that. But each one used it, and as they used it, because they were being chased by their mother, who was the moon, each one of them would throw that object out and then stop her from trying to catch them because she was chasing them. She was ch chasing those seven children. And each one of them went to the sky, and they became one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And the one sister is the one that mystically helped them get up there. So that is represented on our lodges. In the back, we have four triangles. Most of you know some of the, the native traditions in the USA today. There's a dream catcher. This is our dream maker in the back. So if this is the lady's side on this side, your heads would be here on both sides and that dream maker comes back through this invisible door in the back. So that's kind of cool. So if you lived in here, your, your, um, your sacred items would be here on this pole and then that, under that would be your, your altar and then the fire would be directly under the cluster of poles and then your door. So when you go in a lodge of this nature, especially if it's painted, you can't just walk in and walk around in a circle. You have to go in and go this far here, or you go in and you go this far here. You cannot go across the altar, especially if it's painted or if there's a person that owns certain, certain religious items, sacred items. 
So that is almost in a nutshell about the lodges. Now when we do pitch these, it, we start with four and we make a quad, quadrupod and we always end up with an odd number. And each one of those poles have a certain significance and each one of them have a song and a story behind them. And then when you do put the lodge up, this part here is the last one that goes there and that makes it odd. Then you have two ear poles. This controls your wind, it controls the heat, it controls the fire, how it goes up or down or stays hot or cold in there. So we had our own air conditioning, whether it was plugged in or not. There was also a way to keep warm in the winter. There was also a way to keep the, the, the water away and the snow out. And once, once the lodges are tanned with the buffalo hide, they become waterproof. Anything that's smoked with the smoke tan and the way the ladies knew how to do it, it would become waterproof. So we had something for everything, okay? But one of these lodges would be maybe 18 buffalo, a small lodge, that, was, that would be a small one. So the ladies, that was their responsibility, it was their responsibility to create the home, build the home, pitch it, move it, take it down. And each time they moved, in ancient times, they had to unsew each one of those hides that were sewed together here so they could roll it up and wrap it and take it off. On their um, travel -way, you know it as travel -way. they would pack it on there and then haul it. But they wouldn't take all the poles with them. They would leave them in places, again, say for instance, if they camped in this area, they would leave the poles hidden against trees, which were the lodgepole pine. So they didn't drag the poles all the way down to Yellowstone. There was some down there already waiting for them when they got there. So it was quite unique. That is the first uh, mobile home, <laughs> so to speak. Um, the other part of that is today we don't have, use the buffalo robes. The buffalo hide teepee is, is pretty much extinct. Today we use canvas and then we have a special paint that we use for that. I think the only buffalo hide teepee that I know of is in the Smithsonian Institute right now. So the inside was also furnished with buffalo robes and the robes of animals. And speaking of animals, this is, like I said earlier, one of the main... Do you want to take this? Shall I pass the little teepee around? You guys want to look at it? Inside, the kids can look inside. <laughs> These two over here, I will start on this side and we'll just go zigzag and then back, zigzag, and we'll end up on that side with the two rangers, Smokey and Neil. I travel with Smokey. You guys have to listen to him tell you not to play with, for, play with start forest fires, right? Well, that's Smokey over there. Um, speaking of the buffalo, this is just a small buffalo cow. Okay, and this came from a ranch. It has a name, a name tag on it and a, identification number tag and a brand on it. But long ago, we didn't have to worry about those things. Has anybody been from here to Browning or Cutbank up there by East Glacier? Did you see the buffalo herd? It's quite extensive. It's pretty big. It's getting, it's growing. And we've been responsible for bringing that back slowly. Three years ago, uh, the original strain of buffalo that was gone from here since, I think, since the 50s, I believe, came back to our, our area. It came back from Elk Island, Alberta to the Buffalo Calf Ranch, and that was a beautiful sight to see. So that herd is, uh, I believe, on the south side of US 89 and 2 where they, they Y. That herd is there. This one here is the newer one up, up by, by Glacier. But the buffalo was a mainstay. We used everything from head to toe, inside and out. Um, High in protein, very, very high in protein. So we mixed it with certain herbs and, and certain things. We had our trail mix. Whenever the men or anybody would travel, we dried the meat. We did not boil, broil, bake, or fry. It was dried. And that dried was mixed with another um, berry. That berry is the Savas berry or the service berry that you know of. So we'd make that into a, a, a cake, and that was our trail mix. So we had trail mix long before um, the companies invented trail mixes. In our language, we call it mukakin, which simply means 
the mixture, the pemmican and the, the, the berries and the suet or the fat from the animal. Not only did it provide food, it provided clothing, shelter. It provided um, significance in the ceremonies. You would have to have 100 buffalo tongue to be able to do a medicine lodge. And that's how this area got its name. Two medicine lodges were put up here because we weren't allowed to practice that down on the prairie or in our, our areas that we utilized before. So we come up closer to this area and two medicine lodges were, were put up here. And those are very extensive, they're intense, and the woman is the focal point of that and she's the one that is the uh, prime uh, ceremonialist for that. But we don't have our ceremonies with just a male or a female. We have to have that male-female balance for everything we do. And that is from everything in our life has to have a male-female balance. So it's very important to know that. Especially I explain the lodge as a male side and a female side. And that's how you enter the lodge is the male side or the female side, whichever gender you are. And that's not to say the women sometimes can sit on this side, but they, sometimes they do. But if it's a ceremony, it's strict. You have to be on the female side and the male side. Okay. So the buffalo provided food, clothing, and shelter. This tip of this horn here could be uh, filed down, could be a spoon, could be a water vessel. Um, this one will go around as well. This, this would be storage for certain things. There is peppermint in there right now. That's strictly to keep it so it stays smelling a little fresher. But the horn caps come off and there's the, the, um, the bone part that's under there. A lot of people don't realize that those horn caps come off. And this was also used when the young warriors would go out and find a new campsite. The black cotton would holds the coal longer than, than the pine. It doesn't crackle and it keeps the smoke longer. So they would store that in here and then go off to the next site and keep the coal burning and start a new fire. And then everybody would know that that campfire was ready to go and move into that area. So we had our signals too, okay? You wanna come get this? It's not going to hurt you. Junior Ranger, oh, good for you. Then you can do we pass it just like the, the teepee. So when you said that they, those caps come off, is that that they would lose them every year? No, I don't think so. They would not. That's only after they were um, harvested and butchered. So everything was utilized from the head to the toe, inside and out. This is the tail of the buffalo. This is just the end of the buffalo. So not only did it swish on the buffalo's end, it could be used in a sweat lodge and they would take this and put it, and they still do, in the, the, the water area that they bring into the sweat lodge with the rocks, and then they would use it to hit their backs and, and uh, rejuvenate those muscles and, and get those capillaries going and get you, get you speeded up. The women did not sweat with the men. The men sweat by themselves. And after they sweat, they would dive into a creek or a lake or ice cold stream, and they sweat all year long, every, every season, at certain intervals and certain times. There are holy sweats, sacred sweats, and ceremonial sweats, but there are also social sweats. Today, a lot of the people have integrated, other tribes and bands have come in, and some of the women do practice that, but there are sacred ones only for certain groups of people. So here's the buffalo tail. You could use it for a fly swatter or it could take the mosquitoes away from you as well, okay? Okay? Now the thing that, that's really important to remember and the reason that we had buffalo is Creator gave us that animal. Not only this um, animal, but all the other animals that have two toes. And if you've gone on a trek today or hikes, maybe you saw some other animals, did you? Anybody see any other animals? What did you see? Rams, okay, good. The sheep, the big goat, goat there you go. Herd. Moose, Herd. they don't have two toes like this. But you did see one, right? <laughs> they have claws. And there's also the deer and the antelope, but they're down further. And there's stories that go why Creator put the buffalo where they are, the deer where they are, the moose, the elk, and the antelope, the bighorn sheep where they're at in the rocks. So the antelope are down further because they didn't handle the rocks very well. They had to trade with the bighorn sheep and the, and, and the goats. But Creator gave us this to eat as our food. 
and um, we were told not to eat anything with paws or claws. What, ha what did you see today that has the claws? Yeah. One of those. So we didn't eat those. They're very powerful. They're very reverent. They're so powerful and reverent that in my tradition, I cannot say that name. I would have to spell it out to you like B-E-A-R or I say Buxakui, okay, because of the transfers that I have. And the crazy part about that is we can touch that hide of a black one once, twice a year in the fall and in the spring. But we cannot say the name because of his power and the things that that, that animal has given us. So it's very reverent. But these also could be used in before we had jingle bells and the little thimbles and the little uh, bells that we use and you see on different ceremonial items or even the, the, um, the dancing clothes that make jingles. This is what we use. The toes of these animals make different tones, so you can imagine what the deer and the elk and the moose and, and those would be. I think moose hooves are taller, than, are bigger than this. They make a real pretty noise. Here we go. So you can put your fingers in there or you can clank them together and do what you wish, okay? There you are. So it's very important to remember that. Now, everything that we had um, had a purpose and had a reason. I mentioned that even the tongue was used the um, hide was used where you could tan it with the hair on or the hair off to make the robes. And generally, if it was a robe for the winter, the hair was left on, but the hair was on this side with the soft side out. Most people think that the fur was out, but it's, we didn't do that. So, uh, should we let this go around? Because it's more warm? If you because it's warmer. If you have that fur closer, closer to you, it's warmer. Then we had, our, we had our daily clothes, we had our ceremonial clothes, we had clothes for every season. And uh, the, the buffalo itself provided the robes and whatnot, also provided the, the hump of the buffalo in the back here was where the shields would come from because that's thicker, and also the thicker moxen soles, and also provided name. A lot of people have the names that are followed um, by the animals and the plants in our universe where we live. You heard my name as Rides at the Door. That's my husband's surname. Uh, we didn't have surnames at the time. We had our baby name, our adolescent name, and our adult, adult name. That was his grandfather's adult name, Rides at the Door. And he would literally ride at the door and come up and take the enemy's camp, prize camp horses, and ride home with them. And he did things like that successfully for 14 times that we have documented. And, and when he got back from one of his excursions, he gained that name Rides at the Door. So it became now a surname. But prior to that, the baby names would be um, given when they were first born. How many saw the movie Lion King? Remember how they brought Simba into the world and they held him up and they announced him all out to all the people? and they put the sacred paint on his face. That's exactly what we do with our children when they're born. So we, they have a, again, we go back to knowing who we are, where we come from, gives us a good idea as to where we're going. So those things are done. And berry soup is made and we share food with each other and celebrate the, the birth of a new child. And that is very reverent. So that would be their, their first name. By the time they become middle schoolers or adolescents, they would get their adolescent name or coming of age name. Their name would change. And then when they became an adult and did something, a significant, um, I guess, coup, you would say, where they count coup, or they have a significant story behind what their, their accomplishments were, they would get that a different name. So nowadays, we do that still in our family, those of us that follow those traditions. And then if you, you belong to certain religions, and certain other things, you have your three native names, you have your first, last, and middle English name, and then you also have, if you're, you're um, baptized, you have your baptismal name, you have your marriage name, and then you also have a, um, I guess, just your, your, whatever name people want to call you. That's why we just call each other by one name. <laughs> but it's very important to know that, to know who you are and where you come from. The other part of that is the buffalo, when you, you mix it with those plants I just said a little earlier. What do you think we, how do you think we preserve that food? Pardon? We have made salt tracks, but we didn't use salt. 
That came later as a preservative. Smoke would be one. But this little plant here, and if you're walking on the trails, I don't know if you can, oh yes, what were you gonna say? Drying. Drying, yes, that was a good way, very good way. With it, we would mix this plant here. In our language, we call it kakinsimo. But it is peppermint to you. And this peppermint has many, many uses. But this is the plant that we would put with the beet when we packed it in the, in the packaging containers. We didn't have microwaves. We didn't have refrigerators. We didn't have these handy glass jars or the Ziploc bags that everybody uses or even saran wrap. We had to use what we found in nature. And this is a preservative. It's a great preservative. And one way you can always tell a peppermint plant is the stem of this plant is square. And when this comes around to you, you can look inside there and you can see. Not only is it square, it's a great preservative. And little rodents do not like peppermint. Little bugs or insects do not like peppermint. They'll stay away from it. So we found out that this works really well as a packaging preservative. Okay. And if you like, you can take out a little piece of peppermint and chew on it. It's good for you. Not only is it good for your tummy, for tummy mint or whatever ails you there, but everybody knows peppermint in this world is in your everything you have. There's gum, there's candy, there's toothpaste, tooth, toothbrushes. Um, every, everything that you see on the market that has a mint in it is, is from the peppermint family. So shampoos, lotions, oils, soaps, they do a lot of research to, to bring out the natural um, the natural qualities of these things. Peppermint oil is very good for you as well. Not only did we use peppermint for a preservative, but I mentioned earlier about the berries. These are really important to us for the ceremonies. They are hopefully going to be ripe soon. It's been a real slow year. There, there are berry bushes here. That's a Savas berry bush right there, but it's very, very pitiful. There's no berries on there. There's, a, there's some in the campground and some in the picnic area, but they're very green yet. And so I'm saying they're late. But this was our first trail mix, as I mentioned earlier. These are dried in the old way. We would gather these in humongous amounts and put them on a robe and dry them in the sun, much like a craisin or raisins, until they were dried so, so, so well dried that they would be preserved for the full year. And when you did make the soup, you'd reconstitute those, okay? So you can pop one of these in your mouth. I would, if you want to take some, just go ahead and spill it in your hand and take one out and pop it in your mouth. It's not going to hurt you. If there's anybody that's allergic, please say so or, you know, just pass it on. Um, here you go, sir. What is your name? Ian. What? Ian. Ian, nice to meet you. I'm Darnell, Ian. Thank you for being a helper, okay? With the berries alone, we had our Reservatrol. Uh, we had the red quality of that berry. This also has the sweetness to it because we did not have sugar or sugars. We had the natural sugars and fruits from the earth. So this berry alone provided a lot for us. Mixed with um, the berry soup that we have to have for a ceremony, this, this makes a good, it's, a, it's like a pudding that you eat for a ceremony. Some people make um, pies, jams and jellies. And yes, two days ago I was asked if they made wine. Well, I guess pe some people do make Savas berry wine, but I don't. It might taste good, it might not. I, I couldn't tell you. But that is the integral and very important berry in our, in our culture and traditions. There are several other berries that you see on the trail. Behind us there, there's a berry tree. There's some, the bigger leaves in the back there that look like they're huge with the, with the waist edge on them. Those are the thimbleberry. There's also choke cherry through here. We have elderberry, the huckleberry, currants, which are the gooseberry, and um, there's also a real bitter berry that we call the bullberry. You would know it as a, as a soap berry, but when we get that berry, we, we whip it up into, a, a, we call it Indian ice cream. But it's very good for you. So we had our fruits, and we also had our vegetables. Vegetables, what vegetable comes to your mind when you think of vegetables? Carrots. Carrots. Peppers. Lettuce. There's wild lettuce around here, yes. Onions. Wild onion all over the place. There are three different kinds. What? Garlic. 
That would fall into the category with onion, but we had our wild onion. We had wild oregano, which incidentally is part of the mint family because the oregano is square. Ah, we didn't have broccoli. Yay, you don't have to eat your broccoli. <laughs> We do now, though. We plant it in our gardens. But we had the carrot, the wild carrot, which we called yampa. And we had the wild onion. There's three different kinds of wild onion. We also had the wild potato. It, it's what we call the, the spring beauty. It's, it's a little tiny thing now because it hasn't been harvested for, for years. So the, the lack of harvesting is causing it to get smaller and smaller. And we also had the, the turnip, the wild prairie turnip which is one thing that we, we are working with the, the greenhouses, with the college here, the local college, the community college, to bring back those plants and be able to either harvest them or else make sure that we cultivate them when we can seasonally. And some are being, we're trying to grow them in the greenhouse. So it's pretty cool. Um, so we could make the stew. We had stews, we had, we even knew we had a way of boiling things and we, we did, that was called stone boiling at one time in ancient times, where the stomach of this animal would be dug into a hole, the paunch, and then water would be placed in there. So we didn't have kettles and we didn't have pots, we didn't have metal. We didn't do any of the clay work like they do in the southwest, the pottery. We used everything in this area. So the stomach would be the liner for the hole. The water would be carried with the, with the bladder of the, the animal. And once that's cleaned out, it stretches. So the water would be carried in there and you pour it in the hole. Then you'd heat the rocks. And there's certain rocks in this area that are granite-like quality that heat and they hold the heat. And those rocks would be rolled into there. And once there was enough in there, the water would boil. So we would harvest like duck eggs and, and um, bird eggs and put them in there and boil them as well years later. But there are certain foods that I told you we can or cannot eat. People that belong to the thunder, thunder group cannot eat certain birds or animals. People that belong to the beaver societies and the beaver ceremonials cannot eat certain animals. And on down the line. So you had to know your protocol. You had to know who you were and what you belonged to to, um, to survive. And everybody had a job. Everybody had a place. Two of the plants that are really important to us as far as our, um, our ceremonials go are these two. This plant here is called Sapatsumoi. This is sweet grass. And this sweet grass was picked in 1997, 95. And our daughters braided it together. And I really, really like to talk about this particular braid because I brag and say this is how high it grows where I come from. But once that, that's how high it grows where I come from. It's real over six feet tall because I'm only five something. And it's a little taller than me. But this is really important to the Okan, the Medicine Lodge people, the Beaver people, and mostly all other societies or, or um, groups that have certain uh, practices will use the sweet grass. And a lot of people today are beginning to use this a lot. A lot of people, um, other than native people, are beginning to smudge and cleanse their homes. They're beginning to smudge and cleanse the area where they are. They'll use uh, a white sage and they'll burn the whole thing. We weren't given that right to do that. The sage we use, we do not burn. We burn the incense from the sweet grass or the sweet pine. Now the sweet grass, if you'll just keep it in the rope, you can just smell it. It still smells very, very good. Thank you, Ian. The sweet grass is, is harvested once a year and most of the plants that we have are seasonal and you can only get them about now. And you've got to know what you're doing. You have to know where to find it. You have to know how to gather it. And um, each blade is picked individually and not to, to over harvest and not to um, probably desecrate the area that it was in. So you do a little ceremony before you even pick the sweet grass. And we were told in our traditions and our, our, by our ancestors and our grandfathers and grandmothers that went before us not to sell it, although some people do. They'll come and they'll dig it up in clumps and they'll take it and make braids out of it and sell it to different places. That's their practice, it's not mine, okay? Um, so I follow what I was told. 
The other plant that's really super, super important to us is the sweet pine. And it's here, you can smell it the minute you walk in into this area. You, if you know what you're looking for, you um, can, can, I guess, identify it. The sweet pine is really important to the thunder people, and this is what they use as an incense. And you see the pine trees, how they grow there, and there's several needles on one little branch or one little, little um, length of it. When we dry it, it's in, it's in bunches, but we take each individual needle off, and then each individual needle is then re rebroken into several other little small pieces. And that's what we sprinkle on the, on the, the coal and that makes the incense and it goes straight into the sky to creator. You'll be able to smell this. It might smell like your, your um, balsam fir wreath at Christmas or it'll smell like your Christmas tree. That's what that is. It's balsam fir for, lack, for, for the English terminology. The, um, you okay? You can ask questions. That's the other thing. Don't be afraid to ask questions. There's no question that's too small or too large or too silly because if it gets too small or too large or too silly, Smokey and Neil will be able to help me here. Okay. Um, one of the things that I'd like to mention too are birds. Birds are really important in our traditions and our, our, our way of life. This particular bird we have here is a young golden eagle. Now the golden eagle is more valuable and more reverent to us than the bald eagle, particularly because the feathers are more, more prominent. Young ones are still white and they still have a lot of um, brown in them yet. And they're not as, um, when they're mature is when the feathers become really, really prized. The feathers are used, of course, like we said earlier, the bonnet and that straight up bonnet went towards the sky. And also when we do a special uh, occasion. For instance, if our kids graduate from Head Start to eighth middle school or high school, college, or, or whatever, we give them an eagle feather to show that they've made that accomplishment. And in modern days now, that's counting coup. When you collect so many eagle feathers as a younger person, especially as the male, that's when you can make your own bonnet because you can tell a story with those feathers. Each one of them would have a story behind them. So this eagle is very important, not only for the feather part of it, but because of the way it is. How many of you know what the eagle does? Yes, sir. <laughs> we'll come back to you, Ian, as soon as you remember, okay? An eagle, yes? It hunts. It hunts. And how does it hunt? Mm-hmm. It grabs with those three. It'll grab with those three, and then this is the one that clamps down and picks up. So it's very, very um, smart and wise when it hunts. It can catch a fish in water. It can probably catch a, a, a small deer uh, off the ground or a smaller animal. But it's very, very also powerful. When an eagle flies into the sky, he can see maybe a mile above. You can see down below. But an eagle is one of the very few birds and probably maybe maybe the only one that will fly into the storm and above a storm, a rainstorm, and clear it. Like the buffalo. The buffalo will go through a storm and not stay in the storm and go survive out. Whereas other animals such as beef, they just stay where they're at and they'll perish. But a buffalo will go through the storm, so they push on through. So that mimicking these animals is really important in our traditions as well. So this bird, not only will it be a good hunter, able to see, become wise about the weather, but if it gets old, grows old, the beak becomes war, that's pretty sharp, the talons become war, they can't provide for themselves anymore or hunt, they usually go back to their, their, where they were born. And they'll literally pick off their talons They'll beat off their beak and let those grow back and then do their maiden flight one more time so they get a second chance in life. Some of the stories of eagles are really, really super, super awesome. Um, and everything that we have here, we just didn't go out and capture it or kill it. It's either been given to us as a gift 
or like the eagle, we apply to the federal fish and game. And it took us seven years to get an eagle in some of the parts of an eagle. But we are very, very fortunate and very honored to do so. So we have a, a license or a letter that says we can pack this with us or take it with us and share it with all of you. So the eagle is really important. Um, Mr. Weedham, do I, do you, I dare pass this around? Do you think anybody's going to get hurt? So can you all be careful? You want to, do you want to see the eagle claw? Ian, do you think, would that be cool? Yeah. Okay. So just be careful, all right? You can hold it right here. That's part of the drumstick, but we don't eat eagles, right? No. no. <laughs> Is it true, um, I was told, not necessarily, not from the Blackfeet, but I was told that myself as a non-native American, I could not have an eagle ever, unless it was gifted to me. I couldn't just, if I found one, I wasn't supposed to take it. That's, that's the way the law states, but sometimes you also have to remember the spiritual part of that. If it comes to you and it's there for you, it's meant for you, and nobody can dispute that. So um, things are changing, just like somebody might have told you that, that if you, it was given to you by a native person, you can take that to a native person, they can transfer it to you and it becomes yours. So there's, there's the balance there. There's a yin and the yang for everything we do, okay? Um, Any more questions thus far? Ian, could you, did you remember what you were going to say? Okay. <laughs> Even if it's late tonight and you remember, tell your mom and she can get a hold of us and we'll email you back. Okay? I have one more animal I'd like to share with you. We're talking about medicinals and we're talking about plants and things that we use. This little feller. This is called apakai in our language. Apakai is very important. Not only is it um, important for what, who it is, but we call him no friends. This is no friends. <laughs> I wonder why. Why do we call him no friends? <laughs> no friends. Actually, when this little feller was um, displayed in the days of the, the time when the, the incidences and battles were going on or when smallpox came through, if there was skunks on the posts, people would know to stay away from that camp because they knew that there was a disease in that camp. But this also, the medicine from this animal alone would cure things such as diseases like smallpox. But it's very good at uh, bronchial infections, pneumonias. Uh, it's good for chests. But you get that from the belly fat of this animal. And just the fat is what you render down and turn it into an oil and then use that as your, like, much like mentholatum or Vicks. Thank you. So, not only was it used as a medicinal, it was called No Friends, but some people got their names from this. Epicaia simulcon is a skunk cap. And the skunk cap was a reverent name, and some people today carry that name, like we're rides at the door. Skunk cap is a prominent name in our, in our band here on the South Pagan. Ian, do you dare? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Question time. Yes, sir. How big um, were the medicine lodges? The medicine lodges had the center pole, 13 poles around there, and uh, diameter-wise, 24 feet in diameter or a little bigger. Yeah. And it was in the C shape as well. There was the opening here, and then it went around like this. So one pole in the center for creator, but it also represented, represented the so, summer solstice. Much like Stonehenge. Anybody familiar with Stonehenge? There's a object in the middle and those poles there. Yeah, 20 feet on each side, so about 40 feet. Oh, 40 feet in diameter. Yeah, 25 would be a small teepee. Yeah, so there's, it goes 20, 10, 20, 30, 40. Okay, 40 feet in diameter. No, they were done uh, to pay homage and reverency to a certain person that made a, 
a promise or a vow, we call it, so that people would be well, there'd be longevity, and also that if something happened that could heal people. So we've seen miracles done by people that have set holy for a medicine lodge, such as cancer, diabetes, suicides, things of that nature, fire, things that have touched your life closely. And long ago, they used to, when the warriors would go out on battle, the, the, the female people, would some of them would stay back, and they would offer prayers and say that they would put up a medicine lodge, make that sacrifice. It's a big, big sacrifice. It just doesn't take overnight, no, you know, whatever. There's a lot that goes into it. It's a long process. But it, it, it is for the longevity of the people and the well-being. Where are the lodges today? The most of the ones that we we do in our band are in the south side, uh, around Badger Creek, uh, Two Medicine on uh, Two Medicine Lower. This is Upper Lower Two Medicine. The ones you see around uh, at the Y and Browning are not the Oak on. That's a Sioux style sun dance. So there's a big difference. There's a big difference. That's not to say that that the local people aren't involved. They are very much involved. But the Ocon is strictly Bikani, I'm Scrappy Bikani, North Pagan, and the, the, the Confederacy. That's very unique to the Confederacy, the, the Ocon, or Medicine Lodge. The sun dance is what we do after the lodge is, is, is put up. I don't really know about the Confederacy part. Like, mm -hmm. uh, that's a government thing, or like a U.S. government declaration, or how does that? The Confederacy is our own declaration. Okay. It is the four bands. Okay. When they come together, it's a called Siksika Itzitipiwa. So there's the North Pagan, the South Pagan, the Siksika, and the Gainai. Okay. And that makes up the Confederacy. And we are the ones that held this area. The, the, the original territory was held by those four bands. There was one other band that became extinct. It was the Small Robes. And that just melded into another other bands or tribes. Okay. Any more questions? Ian, did you think of it yet? Yeah. Okay, we'll let you go. All right, Mr. Weedham, I think that's it, right? It's up to you. I gotta go down and see the clock. Okay. Um, we have time for more questions. That's it for the presentation. Anything here you'd like to ask about? The skunk is still going around. The claw is still going around. Um, plants are there. Sweetgrass. That's just the way Creator made him, her, yeah, the bird. That's that's what I mentioned earlier. That would be grab with these three and hook with that one. Yes, sir. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yarrow is a good plant. Some of those, no, those aren't all yarrow, that is. The yarrow is good for different things. We call the little leaves on their gopher tail, but the yarrow is good for different skin disorders. It's good for things that you, you could mix it with a peppermint and a rose hip and have a wonderful rose hip peppermint tea with the yarrow. But it also, the flowers of the yarrow are a numbing agent. So if you pick that flower from that yarrow, chew on it, your tongue's gonna go a little bit numb. <laughs> it's good for toothaches. Oh. Things that ail you of that nature. You could stuff your tooth with yarrow that are rent to the dentist. We didn't have dentists in the old days, we had yarrow <laughs> and other things. Yes, ma'am. Oh, that's just my shawl. I brought that along in case I got cold. <laughs> so that's just my shawl. What about for arthritis? Oh, there's many things for arthritis. There's many things for arthritis. We could start with with the with juniper or we could start with um, some things that will will eliminate inflammation. But that is a whole different presentation, everybody's medicine, and that's one of the things that is near and dear to me. Yep, there are things for arthritis, definitely. Yes, ma'am. 
Everything that's here is passed down verbally and orally. We are a oral people. We didn't have books. We had what we call winter counts that we kept things in, in pictograph, historical writings. Everything was passed down from generation to generation by oral history and oral teachings. So if you didn't listen, you didn't learn. So you were always in school from the day you were born to the day you crossed over to the other side. You had to learn, you had to learn. If you didn't listen, the little computer up here, you, you, you just didn't absorb that, that program. Yes, sir. That is, that is, um, it is the Siksike Kitsitipi, it's a confederacy. Writing on stone would give you the pictographs. Well, we did that on a small robe for either the buffalo robe hides that we wore as coats or clothing. And then we all, some people put them on their lodges. But there were certain men and people that were designated to be the winter count person. Because we didn't have the Gregorian calendar. We had winter and summer, and that was very strict. You had to prepare everything in the summer and the spring for the winter and the fall. So now is the time you should have everything just about gathered and done. Okay? Yes, sir. How far into the mountains the All over. Here, we even went over to the other side in that area um, uh, towards, well, we this was one of the passes in here, and then there's a pass at, um, Badger Canyon, and is that the only two? No, there's several passes. Like Logan Pass going to the sun, and this one here, two, uh, Badger Canyon, Bridge Creek, Hellgate. Anybody familiar with state of Montana? Down by Missoula? Yeah. That's how it got its name because it was hell to deal with the Blackfeet, Hellgate. If you overstayed your bounds and didn't abide by our rules and regulations, that's when we made it hell for you. <laughs> okay. Any more? Yes, ma'am. Do you find that today your younger people are they hanging on to your traditions? Not all. They're they're happy with the social networks that they have now, um, but a lot of the things are being taught in the schools. The history, the language is is being uh, taught. We do have an immersion school here. We have uh, language programs. K through 12 in the public school, and there are private schools as well. And then also we have a, a Catholic school, it's grades four through eight, the Data Cell Blackfeet School, where those traditions are being taught along with the, the religious part of it. But most people are, are too busy with the, the, the way of life now to, to do a lot of ceremonies because it's extensive. For instance, these young kids would have to sit in ceremony eight to 12 hours and not be able to jump up, run around, get on their phones or do whatever. They have to sit and listen and participate as well. Our granddaughter was transferred into the Nipomakiks, which is the, the, the young children's society. Chickadees is what they are. And they're the youngest society that we have in our Confederacy. And from age five to 12 or 13, she, she is the leader of the girls and then they learn their protocol, what they do, how they do this. And then by the time she's transferred out, she becomes a parent to that society. So she's able to teach. Then she'll move on to her next eighth grade society up on down, up until she's an elder. An elder not necessarily is age, it's, it's by your knowledge. So that's all taught. So kindergartners, some of the kids are three years old that are able to get into the Naples Makiks. We call them chickadees in training. Okay? All right. I'll let you get back to your campfires if there's not anything, any more questions. And thank you so much for being here.